Welcome to the Five Books for Catholics podcast, where experts explain their pick of five outstanding books on an aspect of Catholic life, doctrine or culture. Liturgical icons have been a part of the Church's tradition from early on, and in 787, the Second Council of Nicaea defined dogmatically that the making and veneration of icons, along with pictorial representation of what the Gospels narrate, is a holy practice. This practice is founded upon the mystery of the Incarnation. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches in paragraph 1161, all the signs in the liturgical celebrations are related to Christ, as are sacred images of the Holy Mother of God and of the saints as well. They truly signify Christ who is glorified in them. The Second Council of Nicaea encouraged the making and veneration of icons, as St. Basil taught that honour rendered to the image passes on to the original. Furthermore, contemplating icons of Christ, Mary, the angels and the saints moves us to contemplate and honour them. In this interview, Aidan Hart would explain his recommended books and icons. Aidan Hart has been a professional icon painter and carver for 40 years, with works in over 25 countries of the world, including with the Pope and other patriarchs. An ordained reader of the Orthodox Church, he's a frequent speaker at conferences and churches and has been in numerous TV and radio programs. He teaches a three-year part-time course in icon painting for the Prince's Foundation School of Traditional Art, and he has published Festal Icons, Beauty, Spirit, Matter, and Techniques of Icon and Wall Painting, all published by Gracewing. Aidan, welcome. Thank you, Father Domini. Um, icon just means image. And the Second Council of Nicaea's teaching on sacred images does not refer to a specific technique of painting and engraving. When you speak of icons, are you referring to liturgical images in general or to a specific form and tradition of iconography? Um, liturgical images in general, we tend to think of icons these days as panel icons. But in fact, the uh, Second Council of Nicaea didn't make that distinction. So I would include embroidered, carved works, illuminated manuscripts. As you said, the word icon means image. So really it's an image of Christ and the saints. That's what defines an icon. And some believe that we live increasingly in a world that is so centered in visual media that it leaves little space for reason discourse. If so, are icons more likely to draw people to the gospel than preaching? The Christian faith is above all a matter of relationship with the living Christ and word and image must go hand in hand. But without images, Christianity can so easily descend into an ism, a philosophy or moralism or whatever. Um, so I, I think of the beauty of liturgical art, not just the, the imagery, but the way churches are lit, the ceremony, the chanting, etc. It's like the fragrance of Christ. Uh, I had this little image in my mind of someone walking along a footpath and there's a big high wall all along the footpath, a bit like these great um, mansions that we have in England. And um, the person's walking along and they smell an amazing fragrance. God, where does that come from? I want to find where this wonderful fragrance comes from, but they don't know how to get to it. It's a very big wall. It goes for miles and miles. So they need to ask a local how to get in to the garden to find out where this fragrance comes from. So they meet a local and the, the local either describes to them how to get there or leads them there. And then the person enters the garden and discovers the source. So to me, liturgical art has many functions, but one of them is to give a fragrance of Christ and then the word is necessary to, as, as it were, fill that out and, and, and um, make it an ongoing relationship rather than just a temporary aesthetic feeling. But above all, I consider with faces. And it's interesting that in uh, Latin and in Greek, the word face is the same as person, prosopon, persona, the face exists for relationship. 
So um, I've noticed going into churches full of icons, particularly frescoes, you immediately realise I'm entering into the communion of the saints here. I'm entering the living relationship with Christ. And my worship on earth is just participation in heavenly worship. Icons are a form of sacred art, liturgical art. Fittingly, therefore, the first book you have chosen is not by an art scholar, but by a father of the church. It is St. John Damascene's three treatises on the divine images. He wrote these tracts amid Emperor Leo III's attempt to outlaw sacred images from 726 on. What are the salient points of St. John Damascene's classic defence of icons? Yes, uh, I chose this book as the first one because it basically lays out all the main arguments which are then ratified, as it were, by the Ecumenical Council, um, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Um, first of all, the incarnation, that's the fundamental thing. Um, he says, for example, quoting him, I do not draw an image of the immortal Godhead, but I paint the image of God who became visible in the flesh, for it is impossible to make a representation of a spirit. So he said that if we say we can't have icons of God, incarnate, then we're saying the incarnation wasn't in fact real. So it isn't just, it's nice to have nice pictures to make us feel gooey <laughs> and, 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 and lovey-dovey. It's a, state, a theological statement, as well as being very useful to uh, encourage a living relationship with the living God. The second thing is um, veneration. He, he said famously that I worship God alone, but I will not cease to venerate all those things for which God comes to me. Um, so I found in my own experience that the, the obvious act of kissing an icon by means of venerating the person depicted helps me to venerate all living people as icons of God. So he, he said, uh, in reality, even the iconoclasts would have crosses. So they're a bit inconsistent, he said. You know, you're allowed crosses, which is just an icon, um, but you won't allow images of the one who's on the cross. So it affirms the incarnation, it affirms veneration. Thirdly, he said that it affirms the goodness of matter. Um, as I said, as quoted earlier from, he said that I worship God alone, but I will not cease to venerate the matter, i.e. Christ's flesh and the whole material world, for which my salvation was affected. So he, he's affirming really the nature of the human person, who's uh, not just a spirit rattling around in a temporary body, but the body is part of our humanity. We have created a unity of spirit and flesh. So he's not just making a statement about the incarnation. He's making a statement in defending icons about the nature of humanity, that God can enter us through our senses, um, not just hearing, but also seeing. And fourthly, he makes an interesting point that the whole of not only creation, but even the Holy Trinity, um, is underpinned by image, and he defines uh, five types of an Im image. He says Christ is the perfect image of the Father. Um, so these, as it were, <laughs> the image exists within the Holy Trinity, even before the whole world was created. And then the second uh, type of image he describes are the um, ideas in the mind of God. Uh, St. Paul talks about according to the pre-eternal plan of God. Um, so as it were, like an artist in a way, we have an idea in our mind, then we make it, but the idea exists before we make it. And then thirdly, so the whole of the material world is, is an icon. Um, the sun and the moon, a rock even, declare something of God's presence. And then he talks about, fourthly, about types, um, say the Old Testament temple would be a type of many things, but one of them is the type of the human person, the body and spirit or the um, Ark of the Covenant, a type of Christ. It's wood and gold. Christ is human and divine. And then fifthly, he said there are things that recall past sacred events, like the jar of mana, was there to remind the Israelites of God's provision for them in the wilderness. And then finally, he says, icons affirm the communion of saints. Um, he quotes, uh, he, he, in his first book, he says, first of all, there is adoration, which we offer to God alone. He alone is by nature worthy to be worshipped. But then for the sake of God, who is by nature to be worshipped, we honour his friends and companions. So again, he affirms that I worship God alone, but because 
of Christ. Um, I honour his friends and companions. Um, so it's one thing the iconoclasts failed to make a distinction of is worship and, and veneration. And it's interesting that Protestants who might oppose icons will actually honour the Bible. They treat the Bible just like an icon as they ought to, but they won't transfer that idea of veneration to images, though the Bible is just an image, it's an icon of God's word. And for your second book, we turn to St. Theodore the Studite's On the Holy Icons. He writes during the subsequent stage of the iconoclast controversy, when Emperor Constantine V grants iconoclasm not just on the second commandment, but on Christology. The Christological objection is that, on the one hand, an icon is listed if and only if it can depict both Christ's human and divine natures, but on the other hand, cannot depict both natures. It, it can sometimes it can it will according to cons, this objection it will confuse it too, and this will amount to monophysism. Alternatively, it depicts his human nature alone, and that amounts to an Nestorian separation of the two natures. Thus, Saint Theodore the Studite resolved these objections and help us to understand the Christological foundations of icons. That's quite right. He, he, he affirms all the things that John of Damascus had said earlier. Um, John of Damascus stressed, I suppose, the incarnation and the goodness of matter. But um, as you have indicated, Theodore dwelt a lot more on the union of the divine and human natures in Christ in his hypostasis, his person. Um, uh, his approach was a bit different um, in terms of his pedagogic technique. He would uh, state the heretical point of view and then he would counter that. Um, he was a very, very incredibly learned man, but um, I think he wrote uh, his works also for the general readership. So, um, but yes, that, that, that's um, fundamental, really, that um, the, that the union of an image with Christ or with anyone is not by participating in its nature, but in the, in the likeness and therefore the person. So, for example, an icon, a painted icon, is not flesh and blood. It's not the same nature as the person it depicts. It's, it's, it's paint on wood. Um, so the link with the prototype isn't through the nature, um, but it's through the likeness and through the person. So we, we might point to an image of Christ and say, oh, that's Christ. We obviously don't mean that, you know, that's uh, the, the Christ with the body right in front of us. But we point to it and say, yes, that's Christ. Um, a bit like in this country, I understand it's illegal to destroy images of, of the queen or of the now the king, um, because we realise there's a connection between the person. And of course, when there's a revolution, um, the first thing people destroy are normally are images of the previous tyrant, the previous ruler. You're sort of um, uh, opposing that person by ripping down their statues, or conversely, you honour a ruler by putting up a new image of them and honouring um, that. Um, he writes, for example, um, we say that Christ is one thing, and his image is another thing by nature, although they have an identity in the use of the same name. So he says that Christ is one thing and his image is another, but there is an identity by virtue of the name. So we can equate name with personhood, um, that the, the link is in the likeness and the person, the name. And elsewhere, he affirms, a bit like um, John of Damascus, uh, that matter can be grace bearing, which is really important. So to quote him, he says, what place is there where divinity is not present in beings with or without reason, with or without life? But it is present to a greater or lesser degree according to the capacity of the nature which receives it. In other words, he's saying that to some extent, even a stone declares something of God. God created it. It, it reveals something of him, whereas an animal um, declares a bit more of God's nature than a stone and a saint more than an animal. Thus, if one says that divinity is in the icon, he would not be wrong, since it is also in the representation of the cross and in the other sacred objects. But divinity is not present in them by the union of natures, for they are not deified flesh, but by a relative participation, because they share in the grace and the honour. 
So it's a bit like my wedding ring here. It's just a bit of gold. Um, so not great value in itself, but it's an expression of my wife's love for me and commitment to me. So as it were, this ring bears the grace of my wife because of of the link it has with her and what it what it means. So um, we could say, I suppose, that Theodore sort of goes down a deeper, slightly deeper level than John of Damascus. And what's interesting, I found, with the theology of the icon, it's not just making a comment about how we should worship God fully and how our liturgy should be, but it's a profound commentary on how we should see one another and how we should see the whole creation. And I, I would say that our ecological crisis has come from a lack of an iconic understanding. Like to me, a tree is a revelation of God. I, I work with wood, so sometimes I have to cut down a tree and use the timber to make something even more beautiful. But even that act of cutting down the tree and turning it into timber for a piece of furniture or an icon screen, it's a priestly act. It's still part of my worship of God. Um, but that comes out of this whole world of, of icons. So the tree isn't God. Um, we're not pantheists, but God is in the tree. God has revealed himself to me through it. I don't worship the tree, but it's a, a gift. It's a revelation of God's love to me. So I'm going to honor that tree in a way I wouldn't if I just saw it as a lump of matter to make me rich, uh, for me to, to, to use and abuse it. So a, a, a Catholic theologian um, friend of mine, um, who, who's a professor and specializes in applying Catholic theology to social issues and ecology, for example, says that if you find a problem in the world, start with the worship. How do those people worship? What do they worship? Um, so worship is like, um, the prototype, the microcosm of how we end up relating to the world outside of worship. So if we don't honor matter properly, if we don't understand the distinction between the prototype and the image, then we're going to mess it up in the world. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, Please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one Europe can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.